Hello everybody and welcome back to another How to Die Virtual Book Club. This week we are going over the chapters on liver disease, blood cancers, and kidney disease. So I hope you guys are ready. I know it was three chapters, a little bit more than we were used to, but they weren't too long as far as the chapters go. So I think we'll be just fine. And um, I'm going to give people, oh hey Britt, I'm glad you made it. I'm going to give you all a little while to show up. So as we're going over that, I, I just wanted to check in with you guys because I know that, <laughs> Britt, you don't have to be serious. I know that a lot of you guys are coming back and you're, you're loving the book and you're learning heaps, right? But how are we hardly lovable, I can say hi to you, but how are we applying this information into our lives? So that that can be the tricky part because a lot of people are good, you know, they get the information, they know, they know what they're supposed to do, but how do you actually get it into your life? So if you guys want to share some of those ways that you all um, have been using the information to get your diets um, more nutrient dense, a little cleaner. Uh, that would be awesome if you all could share and we will see what we get. Equivocal Truth says, I'm putting cranberries in my smoothies. Yes, that's a good idea. I still haven't been able to find any cranberries here in Hawaii. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. We're looking into bulk buying them, but I don't know how to get bulk stuff frozen here. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm just going to call you AD. It's A-D-E-G-H. It says, hi, Lily. I can't stay because I'm on my way to an amazing vegan restaurant. Woohoo! <laughs> I hope you enjoy and have a great meal. Oh, got your book last week. I'm so glad. Oh, Lady Stog, it's 1 a.m. again. F-M-L. Sorry. I know. I, I respect your dedication, though. <laughs> Beverly, yes, you do need to get a copy of How Not to Die so you can understand these. It definitely goes a long way to be reading the book along with us. Purely Soul says, I eat ground flaxseed on my oatmeal every morning, or most mornings. I find they give me gas, but I've been able to tolerate it a lot more now. Yeah, I feel you. It's, it's when you're getting used to new foods, sometimes your gut can take some time to adjust. I know I've told the story of how I incorporated red cabbage into my diet, and it was not pretty, nor did it smell nice, but, you know, I got there. <laughs> uh, Kelly says, mostly just drinking hibiscus tea and adding turmeric to things, trying to get more greens and broccoli in the broccoli family of vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables, Kelly, or brassicas, whatever you want to call them. Um... Britt says, I'm lacking in the beans department, so I went to the store yesterday and stocked up. That's awesome. Yeah, beans can be a tough one for people. Um, that I like cooking my own and just making a huge pot and then having some in the freezer and having some in the fridge so that it's really easy when I go to have a meal. I can just be like, oh, well, I have some beans made, so I'll just take a couple of scoops and, and put them in there. I know for me, I've been incorporating more greens into my diet. I have, like too much kale in this smoothie. To be perfectly honest, my first reaction when I sipped this smoothie was like a small dry heave. I was just like, Ugh. but I've gotten used to it and I'm enjoying the taste now, but it was a little bit, a little bit concerning there at the first taste. Hmm. I've also been sprouting quite a bit. So I have these lentil sprouts right here. They're a little bit older than I usually eat them as, but you can see they're starting to get little leaves there, and they're nice and crunchy and delicious at this point. All the starch has pretty much um, left them, and my favorite thing to do with these is to make a peanut sauce. So a little bit of peanut butter, a little bit of sugar. That's an example of using a processed food to encourage my intake of really healthy foods. A little bit of sugar, um, a little bit of tamari, or Bragg's liquid aminos, or soy sauce, whatever you use, and then some water, and I think I add a little bit of apple cider vinegar in there too, mix it around, and then I coat the, um, the lentils with that. And then I use it as a salad dressing, and it is so good. I've also been working on some broccoli sprouts here. 
And Dr. Gregor has brought up broccoli sprouts a couple of times. Oh, sorry. No, I can't take your call right now. Um, Dr. Gregor has mentioned broccoli sprouts a couple of times, and apparently when they're this age, they have the most sulforaphane. So this is 48 hours after I dumped out the soak water. Um, they have a lot of sulforaphane at this point, but this is not my favorite time to eat them. So I'm like, should I, should I just eat them now when I don't enjoy it to get my sulforaphane? Or should I wait a couple more days when they're like bigger and leafier when I feel like they're more palatable, but apparently they have less sulforaphane. Win some, you lose some, I guess. And then I have been having my weekly Brazil nut. <laughs> and Levi has been having his weekly Brazil nuts too. Alright, I'm going to check in with the comments section with you guys. And uh, thank you for your patience last week with my frazzledness. I do feel a little bit more rested this week. I know everybody's been patient because I haven't put out any videos this week either. I was just super overwhelmed after Saturday and the ballistic missile whoop de doo so <laughs> I'm, I'm chilling. Alright, Megan says, I got flax nutritional yeast and turmeric and I'm adding those. We aren't vegan yet, but we're about three to four days a week now. And that's that's an awesome place. I, I not even to start like that's an awesome place to be definitely you can keep improving and and eliminating a little bit more from your diet as you add more in and it can be a great a great way to get yourself onto a really good habitual habit of being vegan I know that's how that's how I went vegan it took me several years of trying vegetarianism and then slowly trying to be vegan and failing so many times because of cheese and then you know. Oh, Cass says, could you tell us how much you spend on food per week? Because my family feels like we're spending a ton. It would really help. Yeah, um, let's see here. My fruit and veggie delivery every week is about 80 to a hundred dollars, depending on what I buy. And that's definitely our biggest expense. And then when I do my bulk orders where I stock up at the store, that's usually like $300 for probably three months of food. So that would be about what, like a hundred bucks a month for the bulk goods. And then 400, I'll just say $400 a month for the fruits and vegetables. And so we're looking at, what is that like? 125 ish per week for the majority of our diet, and then certainly we add in more stuff for Levi especially, he buys a lot of the extra foods, um, more of the processed stuff. I don't spend money on that, but um, he gives me some money every week and we pool our money and then buy in bulk. So, um, and then he buys his extra processed stuff. So I would say like all up, probably 150 bucks a week, which is like $600 a month which is, it's significant, but food and our health is also, um, gosh, that is really expensive. Food and our health is also really important to us. So that's definitely an investment that I want to be making. So um, I'm, I'm personally okay with spending that money, and I don't remember spending less money when I was eating differently, um, but just because we eat the huge the huge amount of food that we do eat and because we like such a variety um it can it can be a little bit pricey especially here in Hawaii you know it's like you have to add 15 to 20 percent on top of all of the food just for it to be even comparable to mainland prices but you know most of what we eat beans grains fruits and vegetables um everything is under three dollars a pound most of it's around a buck fifty or two bucks a pound and um that's it's not bad because just considering the amount we eat yeah okay um purely soul says do you have any idea on what could be causing a yellow tinge to skin 
beside my nose. I think I've been vegan for a year now and I'm wondering what it could be. So if it's just on one side, I'm not sure. If it's if it's just like a patch, my first thought would be some kind of like fungal issue, although I haven't necessarily heard of that being the case. I know that my skin tends to have like a yellowish tinge to it. You can see on my palm when I do that it kind of goes yellow because I have so much beta carotene lodged in my skin and I've had naturopaths tell me that that's that's a big bad sign that I'm not getting enough vitamin A but it's really just beta carotene. Um, I'm not sure what that could be. Kelly says our grocery bills went down a bunch when I switched to vegan. We only cook vegan at home but hubby eats meat at work. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I feel like, I feel like it, it goes down, but, um, it just depends how much you want to eat and such, okay? Yeah, Crystal says, items like nutritional yeast, flaxseed, hemp seed, etc. is an every two to three months expense for me, so some things like that you won't buy all the time. Yeah, yeah, um... It all just depends, you know, if, if you want more of the processed stuff. I know one of our biggest expenses, if I let it be, would be sauces and condiments and stuff. And I've, there's some things like sweet chili sauce. We like the sweet chili sauce and we get the really healthy kind. And so that's like eight or nine bucks a bottle. And then <sighs> Levi he just <laughs> opens it and like dumps it all over the food and half the bottle is gone. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so. There are ways to make it cheaper, but, yeah. Mm. Yeah, purely soul, no need to freak out about the beta carotene in your skin, necessarily. Okay. All right. Are you ready to get started in the book? What is stuck to your nose? Okay. Hold on one second, I'm going to put her outside. She's antsy. Okay, so, liver disease, <laughs> it's just terrible stuff, I swear. Okay, so speaking of liver function, <laughs> um, number one is alcohol for liver health. Um, you know, excessive drinking for most people is standard drinking. I know... Um, most of my drinking days were in New Zealand and they had a ridiculous binge drinking culture down there. I'm not totally sure what it was like over here in, in the college years, but, um, you know, they'd drink like 14 beers just to get warmed up to go out and then they'd be taking shots and stuff and it was just crazy. So, <laughs> um, definitely alcohol is a big issue when it comes to liver damage and, um, here, 143. Dr. Greger says on page 143 of How Not to Die, heavy alcohol consumption can cause a fatty liver in less than three weeks, but it usually resolves within four to six weeks after stopping drinking. So that's really promising. I know that when I was in my heavy drinking days, I was getting really wasted three or four times a week, which is insane. Um, the thing that most people then say, like, well, duh, binge drinking is bad, but what about moderate drinking? Isn't it supposed to be healthy? And about 10 years ago, there were all of those studies that was like, red wine, definitely have your red wine and your chocolates. And people, I don't know if they started drinking more, if they just used it to excuse the drinking that they were already doing, but um, the thing is that, as Dr. Greger says on page, what was it? Yeah, 143 to 144, um, drinking alcohol regularly is only healthy and good for you if you're not taking care of yourself anyway. So people like the majority of us who are the health freaks in that study, which was hilarious because they say that health freaks were, um, what was it, like exercising about 30 minutes a day and having one serving of fruit or vegetables per day, and that, that was your health freak. So um, those people won't be helped by drinking extra alcohol. Now, alcohol is blood thinning, 
and it does, it is a vasodilator, which means that it helps your arteries to relax. So that's why it helps most people is that it can bring down their blood pressure by letting their arteries dilate wider. Um, that helps for people who are dealing with heart disease as well and who have clogged up. Clogged up arteries and blood flow can be low, but like I said, for those of us who are taking pretty good care of ourselves, there's no benefit to drinking alcohol. And then you have, in addition to the fatty liver disease and the cirrhosis, which, yes, equivocal truth, that's absolutely right, it's a no joke. Um, in addition to that, you have cancer risk. And not just liver cancer risk, we're talking about uh, breast cancer risk, hormonally sensitive cancer risk, um, a lot of cancer risk in the digestive tract. So anything that alcohol touches, it's, it's a poison, you know, and it damages cells. So we're talking about mouth cancer, esophageal cancer, stomach cancer. We talked about that briefly in the digestive cancer area. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. The, um, hold on one second. The other, I wanted to mention something, but I can't find it right now. Anyway, um, then you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And um, every time I think about this, I'm like, oh no, our poor livers. Livers, they're over here, they're on the right side. Um, so the supersize me study that he mentioned where <laughs> scientists in Sweden wanted to replicate the supersize me thing that Morgan Spurlock did. And if you haven't seen the documentary, he basically just eats um, basically just eats McDonald's for uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for however long. Hold on one second, I gotta do some moderating duties. If anyone would like to, um, I'm gonna put you into, oops, I'm sorry. If anyone would like to be a moderator and just keep track of the comments and make sure no one's being annoying or inappropriate, then, um, yeah. <laughs> Ladies dog, I'm, I'm trying. Um, I, I didn't know what he was writing, but, okay, he's in timeout. I can go ahead and, I think I can go ahead and... I'm just going to hide him so he can't even comment anymore. Okay, Lucy, an equivocal truth. I'm going to make you guys moderators, and I think that sticks for life. So, thank you. Oh, and you got it, Hypernova's here. You're a good moderator from back in the day. All right. Okay, we're good. So, um, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease. Um, the super, super size me study, he was eating just tons of fast food, so non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as Dr. Greger says several times, is a thing about, um, oh no, that was kidney disease, <laughs> never mind, or meat and sweet, right? That goes for kidney disease too, I think. Anyway, um, meat and soda, highly correlated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, so, um, says that people who eat meat had about a three, three times the rate of, three times the risk rate of developing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's mostly because of saturated fat, yeah? You also have the cholesterol issue, and apparently that cholesterol can become oxidized, and then it creates fatty deposits in the liver as well. And then, um, so I think Levi's outside the door. And then, um, people who eat, who drink soda and it's not like it's a lot of soda it's like one soda a day which I know is a really basic habit for a lot of people I know my mom has at least one to three cans of coca-cola every day and they have a 45 percent increase of developing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and so if you're doing the soda and the meat at the same time you're really setting yourself up for some serious impaired liver function and then once you start getting it most of the time your liver can recover it's a very resilient organ but sometimes it just it just can't 
you know, and, and then you end up needing a liver transplant, and organ transplants are definitely nothing to mess with, right? <laughs> I gotta, hold on, check in in the comments. <laughs> I know you guys are good. <laughs> All right. Hold on one second, guys. Okay, so in addition to the non-alcoholic fatty liver, which I feel like as long as you're wise is pretty easy to avoid, right? Um, Purely Soul says, my grandma has a fatty liver and she won't listen to eating fruits and vegetables and whole foods because she doesn't like them. Yeah. Yeah, it's like people... I always struggle with that because, I mean... At that point, it's like, okay, well, you're choosing to just kind of slowly kill yourself. And that's sad. Like, that's really freaking sad. And we love these people. Like, we love these people. And they don't listen. <laughs> and it's heartbreaking to watch them, like, eat themselves to death. I made a video about it, I think it was a year or two ago, of... You know, just the grief of when someone in your family won't listen to advice. Because I know that that was at least half of my excitement when I started eating whole plant, whole food plant-based. I was like, yes, all of these things that my family struggles with, you know. Everybody in my mom's family was getting cancer and had diabetes and high blood pressure and dying of aneurysms from their blood, high blood pressure. And, you know, my sister and I had terrible acne and we were struggling with just gaining weight no matter what we did. And I was so excited because I thought, yes, you know, this is such a great solution and it's working so well for me. But nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> Yeah. Blow, blow torch a curly fry? That's a good name. She says, my best friend and his husband are obese and they're trying to make major changes. He doesn't even want to eat meat, but... She, or she, she doesn't even want to eat meat, but her husband hates beans. Well, you get, uh... You do what you can. Give them time. Maybe they'll come around? Um, I don't know if <laughs> we're... A lot of Levi's co-workers right now. <laughs> Levi works with these guys, right? They're they're carpenters. They're in construction. Like, they're meat eaters. And every job that he goes to, he always influences people, you know, and they end up eating more fruits and vegetables and stuff. And um, now these guys are wanting to go vegan. And one of them went vegan. And he's become one of those, like real hardcore vegans where he's he's like oh you're gonna die of high, of high cholesterol you're gonna catch a heart attack and um talking about the health stuff so much but his wife is like really mad at him for trying to go vegan and she's giving him tons of shit about it and i think she even said that if he doesn't go back to eating meat she might divorce him and i was like you've got to be kidding me and i told levi to go to work and tell him like 85 percent of vegans are women and God knows we're looking for some good men, right? <laughs> don't don't waste a vegan man like that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Kelly says, slip the beans into the baked goods. That's a good idea. And you know what, you guys? Last week I made some chocolate banana ice cream, and I put black beans into the chocolate banana ice cream, and it was phenomenal. Nobody even noticed, even though we all love beans, but... No one noticed it was there, and it made it so creamy and, like, a little bit thicker and denser and delicious. So, black beans in the banana ice cream. I'm not sure. There wasn't even a recipe. I just did, like, you know, Vitamix that much full of bananas. Scoop of black beans, some couple tablespoons of cacao powder, and a little almond milk. It was good. All right. Whew! Equivocal Truth says chickpea chocolate chip cookies. That sounds good. Yeah, and we do have the, the black bean brownie recipe up on the sex of tablespoon. All right. <laughs> Just joined, but I got a copy of How Not to Die, and I didn't know I'd be so emotionally affected. I'm not sure if you're kidding or not, but I feel you there. Like, it's... 
this book is intense. It changes lives. All right, back to the liver disease. Hepatitis. Um, <laughs> so A, B, C, and D. I feel like it's pretty easy to avoid. You know, it's like don't eat feces, try not to eat other people's blood, um, be wise about how you're having sex, and you know, you can, you can be fairly okay. Um, but then there's, there's bacon, and I had no idea that there was a type of hepatitis associated with bacon, but, um, we have another scary pig disease. So, you'll remember from the infectious disease chapter, pigs, scary. Um, so, what was it, 11% of U.S. pork livers were contaminated with, um, porcine hepatitis, and so there was also some correlation studies where they looked at do people with, um, who eat pork, do they have higher levels of hepatitis and liver disease, and indeed they do, and, you know, I, I just think about this, and after the infectious disease chapter two, it's like, I, I don't understand how it's, um, how it's wise to just keep eating food that you need, like, bleach to clean up after, and food that's so easy to cross-contaminate, and, you know, these are really serious consequences. It's not like, oh, I ate pork and I just don't feel well. It's like I ate pork and potentially got hepatitis and liver disease. So, that's, that's rough. Um, Julia says, I'm trying to eat whole food, plant-based, vegan, and high-carb, low-fat, but I'm getting really bad stomach acid reflex from starches, like potatoes, rice, oatmeal. Do you have any advice? Um, I see some people are getting some good recommendations. So, Julia mentions even with no oil or fat, because... Um, when you eat fat, it can relax the sphincter, sorry to use that word, the sphincter between the um, stomach and the esophagus, so that's one thing. Um, Scrap Saturday says, Julia, eat as clean as possible, more raw fruits and veggies, and slowly introduce starches one at a time at your dinner and see which ones affect you most. Um... Kelly says, try limiting your liquids before, during, and immediately after eating starches. That's a great recommendation. Mind Body Food says, apple cider vinegar and water helps my acid reflux. Reflux, I assume that you took that before you had your meal, is my assumption. That's um, what the recommendation is as far as I know. Um, I know that when I switched, when I switched and started eating more grains and stuff. Grains definitely had that effect on me as well. Even now, if I have oatmeal for breakfast, I get a little bit more acid reflux. I do have to be really careful not to drink water after my meal or I will start burping up stuff. Um, so I feel you there. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting used to it and um, kind of eating small amounts consistently. Speaking of which, excuse me small amounts consistently and then your digestion kind of gets used to it. That happened with me and brown rice, like now I'm fine to eat brown rice. Um, there are also things like, I know that if I combine a starch with um, like tomato paste or tomato sauce or something like that, I'm going to get super burpy and acidy. So it can just be a matter of your body as well, okay? Um, I did see, we were talking about the hepatitis and the hepatitis B, and Equivocal Truth says, what about vaccines, though? I get really confused about the vax issues. And yes, that's, um, you know, the whole vaccination issue, I feel like there are a lot of problems on both sides. The anti-vax people are kind of being, like, belligerently and purposefully not listening to the data, and then the people on the pharmaceutical side are also, like, belligerently and purposefully not listening to the data. Like, there need to be questions about um, vaccine additives and certainly how we're being vaccinated, and until those questions are adequately and respectfully addressed by, you know, vaccine manufacturers in a way that's not condescending and ignores a lot of data, um, until those are addressed in a way that's adequate, like, I feel like 
it continues to need to be pushed. Like, why are we getting vaccinated so much? Why are children being vaccinated for a sexually transmitted disease, hepatitis B, on the first day of their lives when their blood brain barriers aren't as intact as they should be, as they need to be to prevent potential um, contaminants or additives from reaching their brains when, when they're young and vulnerable. So, um, you know, I think I got the hepatitis vaccine when I was like seven or eight years old because that's when it first started being available and um, I'm, I'm honestly glad that I grew up a little bit earlier because um, I still didn't get that many vaccines. So, um, or I guess they were more spaced, spaced further apart and as far as I know I've been vaccinated against most everything. I don't get my, um, my booster vaccines and I definitely never get flu shots because I'm not going to do it unless it's absolutely necessary. I do feel like, you know, if you are sexually active or um, exposing yourself to hepatitis B, high risk activities in some other way, I don't feel like it's a terrible idea to get the vaccine, you know? Okay, we're getting off on tangents. I'm gonna... Yeah. Britt says, I still cry sometimes when I think about how I wish I knew what I knew then, what I know now. And yeah, I feel you there. It is it is wonderful that we got to this information when we did. But, you know, and it's hard too because you want to share it with your family and they don't always accept. Yeah. All right. So, avoiding hepatitis. Um, definitely not going to eat pork kind of scared about the pork I did used to eat. Um, and then I was really happy when Dr. Greger briefly spoke about the supplement industry because that's so concerning. I get so mad and disappointed and sad when you see these things for like weight loss supplements. Hi! <laughs> when you see these advertisements for weight loss supplements, and you see these ridiculous things promised, and then you read the ingredients, and they're just terrible ingredients, and they're dangerous ingredients, and because the supplement industry is not well regulated, you end up getting desperate people buying really dangerous supplements, and nobody consults their doctor before they start taking a freaking weight loss supplement. They just take it, and then Half the times they don't even dose themselves correctly. Like, you know, Levi used to take the, the weight loss stuff when he was younger because he was really overweight when he was a kid. And it's just, it's just so not fair that desperate people are preyed upon like that by an industry. And it's so not fair that even when a product does get banned, oftentimes they'll just like very, make very small tweaks to the formulation and then release it as if it's a new product and release it as if it's safer when it's not. And then you see the studies that they provide, you know, obviously industry funded, very short studies looking at toxicity. And in my experience with people, they're not taking weight loss drugs and, and supplements like that. Um, for just short periods of time. I feel like they just keep doing it and keep doing it hoping for a result that may or may not show up, you know? Well, doesn't because it doesn't work. But um, it's something that I would never <laughs> recommend or allow are these gimmicky supplements. Even stuff like, you know, the green coffee bean was really popular a couple years ago. I'm sure Dr. Oz got a huge kickback for advertising that so much. Um, but that stuff, even when it's natural, oftentimes it does end up being associated with issues with liver or kidney health um, or other kinds of issues or diseases or cardiac arrest, right? So we'll finish up the liver chapter. He talks about some breakfast foods, right? You got your oatmeal, your whole grains, and coffee. So, um, definitely he was talking about whole grains. 
being much more protective than refined grains because refined grains are actually associated with higher amounts of liver disease. So again, back to like the meat sweet thing, it's like meat, saturated fat, cholesterol, that kind of thing. And then you have your refined foods, your, um, you know, sugars, high fructose corn syrup. And then we all know that, um, refined grains tend to convert into sugar very quickly inside your body. So that kind of causes the same issue. So definitely when you're opting for foods, I feel like whole grains are great. And, you know, like I have... I really don't eat that many whole grains, so um, that's one of those things where I don't feel like I need to improve because I eat a pretty healthy whole plant food diet anyway, and I eat a lot of fruit and stuff, so um, that's, that's like, um, totally lost my train of thought. Yeah, so whole grains don't stress, I, w I wouldn't say like, they seem to be protective I'm not sure you have to force feed yourself whole grains if you don't like them, right? And then the coffee thing, which was also interesting. So coffee, protective against liver disease, only if you're eating like a high risk kind of diet. For people like us who are the health freaks, who are eating mostly low fat, whole plant food diets, you know, there's no reason to chug coffee. It's not going, it's probably not going to add any additional protective effect. So I'm not going to take up a coffee habit just because it does have some pros and cons to it, especially when it comes to nutrient absorption or assimilation or conversion within your body. Um, there's also the caffeine issue and then there's the tooth coloration issue. So um, it's something to think about if you already have liver issues, certainly. But prevention with a whole plant food diet appears to be much more effective, right? Sarah says, I limit my coffee, but I haven't fully given it up. And I'm not sure that there's a reason that you have to fully give it up, um, especially if you're wise about potential supplementation on a vegan diet. Like, um, I've made a video about it. It's definitely important to do the B12. Definitely supplement with the B12. Um, a lot of people in Northern Hemispheres need to have a vitamin D supplement, not a super high mega dose of vitamin D. Um, and I would say only if you have a confirmed um, deficiency of vitamin D. Um, and then DHA and EPA, which are your omega-3 fatty acids, um, coffee can definitely affect the conversion of those. So like if you eat flax seeds, you're getting the precursor to those omega-3 fats you need to um, be able to convert those if efficiently enough. Like, humans do small amounts of conversion anyway, but that's the subject of a whole other video. But if you're a regular coffee drinker, you might want to consider supplementing with an algae-based DHA supplement. Okay. Elizabeth says, I enjoy the flavor of coffee. I don't drink it often, and when I do, I drink eight ounces or less. Never seem to finish the whole cup. Yeah, and that's good. And the other thing that I always forget to mention about the coffee, just because I'm like, in my head, it's a duh, but um, black coffee, we're talking about black coffee, not super sweetened coffee beverages from Starbucks, not coffee that contains a bunch of milk and stuff. So black coffee. Okay. All right. I'm glad everyone is here. Yeah, Sarah, um, algae-based DHA supplements. I actually just started taking one a couple of months ago, and I'm, just, I'm kind of play, playing with it. Just see if I notice any difference or if I notice any difference in, like, skin quality. Equivocal truth, I did make you a moderator, but it looks like it didn't stick. Okay, I've done it now. Okay. Yeah, Sarah, that's a good question if anyone's had the mushroom coffee, because I haven't had that. And, like, I know mushrooms are great, but that's one of those things that kind of triggers my bullshit detector. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> are, are we sure? Do I need to be paying a ton of money for this? I don't know yet. I have to look into it. All right. So now we're on to blood cancers, which I feel like I should say with less of a smile. Now we're on to blood cancers. That's more appropriate. 
Okay, so last year I read this book called The Emperor of All Maladies, and it was about the history of cancer treatment, and it was horrifying. Horrifying. I'll say one more time, it's horrifying the way that we have been um, trying to treat cancer. Britt, if you're going, bye. Thank you for coming. Okay. So, however, despite the horrifying way that we have been trying to treat cancer and still very much failing, um, one of the success stories is with blood cancers, with these liquid tumors, as they're called. Um, there's a pretty great cure rate in kids that end up getting leukemia and stuff. Oh, <laughs> Brett, okay. <laughs> um, but still yet, even kids who have leukemia or lymphoma or, or whatnot, um, when they do get treated, usually effectively with the chemotherapy and such, even though they're cured, it's like um, it, the treatment, the chemo, increases the risk of developing other tumors, uh, solid tumor cancers, um, also increases the risk of developing leukemia again. Um, so it's definitely not one of those things where it's like just a success story and we'll leave it at that and don't worry about leukemia anymore guys, we got it. Um, it's one of those things where it still needs to be prevented, okay? Okay, so you got the leukemia, which affects white blood cells, the leukocytes. Um, you got lymphoma, which affects the lymphocytes, which are in the lymph lymphatic system. Then you got the myeloma, which affects the white blood cells, which are the plasma cells, which make the antibodies in your blood, right? Dr. Greger went over it. We probably don't have to cover all that again. So... I was really encouraged by that University of Oxford study that found that plant-based diets are protective of many different types of cancers, but perhaps most protective against blood cancers, right? <laughs> Don't worry, guys. I'm going to put them in timeout. I don't like compliments. <laughs> okay, so... Um, the University of Oxford study found that um, people who eat plant-based diets have about half the risk of developing blood cancers as people on the standard Western diet, and that's really significant. Um, he very briefly mentioned the sulforaphane, which is in the broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables, especially high in the broccoli sprouts. I feel like I should just open that up and start eating it right now. Um, but it's actually all leafy greens, and all citrus is really protective. And, you know, that's something that I've been changing to in my diet, is that um, I've been trying to eat more citrus, and then I don't think he's mentioned it yet, but I know in other chapters he talks about how beneficial it is to also eat the citrus rind, because there's, like, the zest is so healthy and good for you, and so, you know, I had oranges this morning, I was eating them, and then... You know, like every five orange pieces, I'll just take a bite of the peel. Take a bite of the peel. And it's not too bad, and I'm like, yeah, I did good things for myself today. I prevented blood cancer and melanoma, right? He did mention, though, however, and I love when he mentions this, that it's the foods, the antioxidants that are in foods, not the antioxidants that are in supplements that are effective. My mom from the other room, oh my god, we need to get broccoli. Yeah, I like your mom. She sounds great. Quibble Truth says, citrus really hurts my teeth. Yeah, the acidity doesn't always work for everybody. Elizabeth says, I usually eat the peel and raw garlic. You badass, Elizabeth. <sighs> Scrap Saturday says, ooh, that's hard to eat, Lily. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, it's one of those foods that I like because it's, you know, healthy and really good for me, and you can just taste the health of it. And it protects against melanoma, and with the amount of sun exposure that I've had in my life, I'm like, I'll take it. I'll take 
when I switched from regular size swimsuit bottoms to like the ones that are popular now, you guys have probably seen me wear them of like, it's essentially a thong. I got some very, very bright red racing stripe burns. And so it's like, I, if I get melanoma, it's gonna be there. I am a walking mandarin. I like that. Blessed mandarins. Okay, so the high antioxidant foods, quote 157, there it is, yes. Antioxidant supplements don't work, okay? He says on page 157, down near the bottom, he says high dietary intake of antioxidants is associated with significantly lower lymphoma risk. Note that I said dietary intake and not supplementary intake. Antioxidant supplements don't appear to work, for example, getting lots of vitamins associated with lower lymphoma risk, but taking even more vitamin C in pill form did not seem to help. The, the same was found for carotenoid or carotenoid antioxidants like beta carotene. Apparently pills do not have the same cancer fighting effect as produce. <sighs> and then he says when it comes to certain cancers like those of the digestive tract, which we talked about a, few, a couple weeks ago, he says antioxidant supplements may even make things worse. Um, antioxidants like vitamin A, vitamin E, and beta carotene in pill form were associated with increased risk of death with those who took them. So not only are the supplements kind of dodgy for like liver and kidney health, a lot of the times you don't even really know what's in them, but then you get these isolated nutrient supplements that claim to help, and they don't, and then people usually use them as an excuse to eat crappy food, and they say, oh, don't worry about it. I have a multivitamin, or I have my B complex. I'm not concerned. So, dietary antioxidants, yo. Who here does the acai berries? Anyone? I'll let, I'll give you guys a moment or about the acai. I have never gotten into the acai berries because they're expensive and they come in those little pouches and I'm like, I'm confused. I don't even know where to find them. <laughs> expensive. Oh. <laughs> Dima says, antioxidant supplements, why? It's so easy to get them. It's like fiber supplements, just why? Uh, it's laziness and trying to make a buck, I think. Britt says, I never saw my grandpa cry. He is a very prideful man, but I will never forget the last time I saw him. I told him I loved him and he cried. He was always in a lot of pain because of leukemia. Yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking, man. I'm so sorry, Britt. It's, it, it is, it's just heartbreaking. A friend of mine here, her dad got leukemia a year ago and he was diagnosed and died four days later. I know I've mentioned it before, but he always said, I'll, I'll turn vegan when I get cancer. Like, what? <laughs> I'll turn vegan when I get cancer. And he got cancer, and then he slipped into a coma, and it's really sad. All right, it looks like a lot of you guys are doing the acai. Jeez. Equivocal Truth does it. Lucy does the acai. Hypernova, all my moderators are on the acai. <laughs> Purely soul, soul says, I want to get some frozen acai. Me too. Like, they're yummy. I've had like two acai bowls in my life and it was freaking good. I feel like it would make a great smoothie. If I can, <laughs> if I can find some, some like less expensive stuff, if it's not in the plastic packs, the little single serving plastic packs, because I'm trying to reduce my waist, you guys. <laughs> Sunny Pepper says, Amla and hibiscus for the win. Those are obviously other options too. And then Dr. Greger was nice enough to talk about some other high antioxidant foods on page 159. He says, in terms of antioxidant bang for your buck, acai berries get honorable mention, beating out other superstars such as walnuts, apples, and cranberries. The bronze for best bargain, though, goes to cloves and silver to cinnamon, and the gold for most antioxidants per dollar, according to the USDA, is purple cabbage. So, that's, um, I gotta get some cloves, you guys. How can I incorporate cloves into my diet? Maybe I could cook some beans with cloves, but I feel like that might get weird. 
might go well in the smoothies. I could grind them with my flax seeds, maybe add in some poppy seeds for the extra calcium boost and, you know, opiates. Ooh, vegan eggnog. Yes. Lucy says more chai tea, cloves and tea. Oh, yeah, I gotta do it. I gotta do it. All right, I'm gonna get some cloves this week. You guys make sure you got some cloves too. Kristen says boil it in rice. Mmm, I'll have to try that. Um, Redheaded Princess says, would purple cabbage still be high in antioxidants if fermented? Um, I can't say for sure, but my guess would be probably. Um, the thing about the fermented cabbage, though, is that it's often really high in salt, and since salt is an oxidant, um, I think it's smart to just kind of think about that. Like, if you're eating an oxidant with your antioxidants, um... How much, like, could could we maybe do it differently, right? Ah, oh, Britt says cloves are great for toothaches, just FYI. Ooh, yummy. Dr. Gregor's purple cabbage slaw is my jam. I gotta get... I gave away all of my copies of his cookbook, which I'm happy to do. I'm glad people have them, but I have to get a copy for myself now. Ooh, Beverly says maybe clove... Clove muffins? Cheryl says she makes chai oatmeal, and that sounds so good. Okay, Redheaded Princess says, oh, I ferment my own cabbage without salt. It doesn't last long, but it's good. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And my assumption would be the sulforaphane would still be active um, in that kind of fermented cabbage, but again, I can't say for sure. Okay. All right, ladies dog. Is that how you pronounce that? I hope so. Thank you for joining us. I hope you sleep well. It's 2 a.m. where she's at. <sighs> Blessings to you. All right. Megan says, well, damn, I want to eat fermented veggies to help my heart burn, but I don't want to make my blood pressure worse because of the salt. Yeah, that's definitely like a trade-off um, that, you, that you have to think about. I don't I'm not, I'm not an expert on fermentation by any means, but I feel like something such as um, fermented veggies using the, the vinegars or something, um, there's probably a way around the salt, and like Redheaded Princess just said a moment ago, she does her own, yeah? So there are ways to do it. Um, back to the spices, we have curcumin and multiple myeloma. So myeloma is the one that originates in the bones. Well, I guess they all do, but myeloma usually comes up in multiple places and it's quite fatal, so it's important to prevent it. And the encouraging thing was that um, taking turmeric seemed to suppress or limit the growth of those myelomas. So again, since prevention is really the key because the survival rate is so low, I feel like it's a great idea to Take your turmeric anyway. And then we saw a few chapters ago in the digestive cancer chapters, you know, um, turmeric can be great for the pancreatic cancer prevention as well. And since those two types of cancer are so fatal, prevention is key. So we're going to prevent as much as we can before we get that diagnosis, okay? So then we get to the part about... Um, Cancer viruses, again. <laughs> cancer viruses. Before I got into that, I did want to ask you guys, like, is anyone doing, um, how are you doing your daily turmeric? I usually do mine in my smoothies. I do have some turmeric in this smoothie, even though I don't always add turmeric to the green smoothies because of the oxalates and whatever, it's not a big deal. But turmeric in my smoothies is my primary way of getting it. Um, I do have a specific recipe for like an anti-inflammatory dose that I give myself when I have pain. Um, usually that's like uterine associated pain, but anyway. I was just curious how you guys are doing your turmeric. So Lucy says, I make chai golden milk with almond milk. That sounds really yummy. Britt says, I had like two tablespoons of turmeric in my banana smoothie. Not recommended. Yeah. It's definitely dose-dependent. Dose Big doses are not good. Kelly says, smoothies are tea unless I know I'm having a turmeric-heavy meal for dinner or lunch. Yeah, that's great. 
Megan, turmeric in the oats is a great idea. Woo. Um, do I always pair it with black pepper? Sunny, I would say that I pair my turmeric with black pepper like half the time. Sometimes I remember there, there are times when I do put black pepper in my smoothie. There are other times when I just don't want that because you can't taste it a little bit or it, it might give me a stomach ache sometimes. Um, if I'm cooking with turmeric, I definitely go ahead and add in black pepper because it's just delicious. But all the black pepper does is limit your liver's detoxification capabilities. So it slows down the speed at which your liver can detox, which is an issue for prescription meds, okay? Just something to think about if you're on meds and you do the black pepper, it can slow down how fast your liver can metabolize those, right? So um, in, in the case of like digestive cancers, Really just getting the turmeric into your digestive tract is great. You don't have to worry so much about um, absorption and getting it into the bloodstream. Oh, you're going to go? Yeah, okay. I'm going to go. Bye. How's it going? And it's patines. Yeah, it's going well. I'm yeah. talking too much as always. But... Oh, my pleasure. Look at that. Okay. All right, see you later. going to go get the girls? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Everybody says hi. Right. You can just leave that open for her. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, thank you guys for sharing how you're doing your turmeric. Pickled turmeric sounds awesome. Interesting. We got some people doing it in burrito bowls. I like that. Natalie says, I bake turmeric yellow potatoes. Turmeric has really helped clear my skin. Yes, Natalie, turmeric is like my acne secret weapon. Thank you. <laughs> Britt says her two tablespoon turmeric was the orangest smoothie she's ever seen. I feel you. I still have like turmeric fingernails right now. I don't know if you can see because I grate mine. All right. Ooh. Auntie Bonnie says, I've started pickling my turmeric and eat it on everything. That sounds pretty awesome. Um, Love It All says, what do you do when with turmeric when it starts to stain your teeth? That's part of why I have it in the smoothie, is so it doesn't tend to stain my teeth. I have noticed that if I like eat something, chew something with turmeric after I've done my charcoal whitener, um, because that kind of damages the enamel a little bit, my teeth are more likely to absorb the color of the turmeric. So I do definitely avoid turmeric in, say, the 12 hours after I do my tooth whitener thing, which is like once a week. Um, also, citrus or strawberries or kiwi fruit or anything that's acidic, top layer of enamel. I definitely avoid turmeric with that. Although someone told me once that turmeric was a tooth whitener and like if you brush your teeth with turmeric, it'll make your teeth whiter, but they also had really stained teeth. So <laughs> I'm gonna not trust that. Okay. All right. Chocolate is me fave says, I've only ever used turmeric for skin care and never consumed it. Hmm, see, and I have like turned my skin so orange by using it on my skin. <laughs> I'm probably doing something wrong. Mm. Yeah, I would say, like, I grate mine up and put my turmeric in my smoothie, and then I just drink it, and it's like, you know, you can't even really tell that it's in there. And then it just goes away without touching, touching my teeth too much. Okay. Does fresh turmeric have benefit? Does fresh turmeric have more benefits than powdered? Um, Dr. Greger does go over that later in this book, but it appears that um, they have slightly different properties, but one is not healthier than the other. Um, they're both incredibly healthy. I think, I think the fresh was like prevents DNA mutations slightly better, and the powdered is slightly better for inflammation, like the anti-inflammatory effect. Don't quote me on that. We will get to it in the book, but both are great. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Now we get back to the animal viruses, which are terrifying. Like I'm just terrified by freaking viruses now. 
and part of me wants to be really smug and be like, haha, all you people eating meat with your animal viruses. And then I remember that I used to eat so much meat and drink so much milk. Bovine leukemia virus. Terrifying. I don't understand how people still... <laughs> I don't understand how people still eat this stuff. Oh, I had a quote I wanted to read you. Mm. Oh god, and then poultry again. Yeah, it says, this is on page 160. Poultry tended to be associated with the greatest increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, all grades of follicular lymphoma and B-cell lymphomas, such as B-cell chronic lymphoma leukemia, lymphatic leukemia, including small lymphocytic leukemia and polymorphic lymphocytic leukemia. Jeez. Jeez. Um, the EPIC study, which, if you're not familiar with the EPIC study, it's it's a big one for us plant-based folks. Um, it says the EPIC study found that risk increased between 56 and 280% for every 50 grams of poultry that was consumed daily. For comparison, a single cooked boneless chicken breast may weigh as much as 384 grams. And that's just terrifying. And then you combine that with the, um, a couple of chapters ago we read about the risk in pancreatic cancers that people who worked in slaughterhouses had. And then here on page 161, Dr. Greger starts going into the, um, oh, I just wanted to page to you, but, um, the workers in poultry slaughterhouses have been found to have higher rates of cancer of the mouth, nasal cavities, throat, esophagus, rectum, liver, and blood. And that's just so gross. Like, it's just awful. And then you have all these people that have, like, the butcher's warts. Like, what? And then butcher's wives have a higher rate of cervical cancer? Which is, you know, associated with HPV, human papillomavirus, another wart virus. And it's like... I mean, I don't even know what to say about that, except I can't wait for for frickin' cult meat to appear and just take over factory farming. So, you know, it's like, some people are always gonna eat meat. There's no way around that, but like, how is this happening? And then, at the end of that whole report, the, um, the researcher concluded that the risk for safety, like occupational safety, is not trivial. Is not trivial. Like get some get some balls and like say what you really mean. Like it's terrifying. <laughs> oh man. It is pretty hard not getting outraged. Yes. Fifty grams is not much. Absolutely correct. Uh, oh, I missed some stuff. You guys have such fun in the comments section. I wish I could just play in the comments section, too. Mm. Amber says, Lily, I'm so glad you're not against smoothies. I find that it's such an easy way to get so much nutrition. Yeah, I go back and forth. You know, I, I love my smoothies. I really do. They are a great way for me to get a lot of nutrition and hydration and I just feel really great when I have smoothies, but sometimes I do get onto the fruit bowls, and I tried it for like six months where I really didn't have smoothies. I just kind of tried the fruit bowls to see if there was any difference in my digestion, and I really didn't notice any um, gut health-wise. Like, everything felt pretty much the same, so eventually I did go back to my smoothies because I love my smoothies. Mm. Okay, quick question, and then we'll get into the kidney disease. Kayla says, blending versus juicing. What is your take? Okay, so blending is essentially the whole food, right? 
I put whole foods into my blender, hit blend, woo! So when I drink this, it is slightly processed, you know, but all the fiber, all the nutrients are there. And since so many of the phytonutrients in whole plant foods are actually bound to the fiber and they're not liberated until bacteria in your colon ferment that fiber and liberate the phytonutrients and then they are absorbed into your body, into your bloodstream, into your digestive tract itself, that tells me that when you juice, you're not just losing a little bit of fiber, you're actually losing a lot of the potential nutrition. Um, so you really need, you need that fiber. Don't get rid of it, you know? I don't think you, I don't think people absorb more nutrition from juices, right? Okay. Hope that makes sense. Oh, sorry, my hair's drying, and I did like a vinegar rinse on my hair, so I'm just letting it air out before I have to go see normal people and stink. <laughs> All right. Equivocal Truth says, juice makes me feel terrible. I get so shaky and nauseous. Yeah, it can, you know, have some blood sugar effect as well, since there's no, um, no fiber in it. Britt says, oh, I thought you meant you chew it and that's how you blend it. <laughs> Did you? No. No, I actually blend it in my, <laughs> in my blender. All right. <laughs> yeah, juicing is also really expensive. I'll agree with you on that. I had a juicer and then Levi replaced all the electrical and now every time I plug in my juicer, it trips the electric. So I can't, <laughs> I can't use my juicer anymore. Okay, so kidney disease. So my first reaction when starting to read this chapter was when he said that we pee one to two quarts of fluids a day and I was like, excuse me, who are you talking about? Not me. I'm pretty sure I'm peeing like five gallons a day, like pretty confident. <laughs> And the only way that I got over that shock was to read one of the next freaking what was it, one of the next paragraphs? So it was, it's on page 165 that says that only 41% of Americans have normal kidney function. Like, what? Less than half Americans have normal kidney function? 59% are just... And you're not hearing about it. We're not hearing about it. Why are people talking about this all the time? Like, kidney's not working right. And it starts in your 20s, apparently. Oh. Wow, Demon says her husband is a living kidney donor. That's pretty impressive. Lots of people acknowledging that they pee about once an hour. Like me. That's great. About once an hour. Perfect. Nice, light yellow pee. No smell. That's what we look for. It's fantastic. <laughs> After my quart of water in the morning, plus my quart of smoothies, I pee every 20 minutes for two hours. Yeah, I'd believe it. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Leslie Smith says, I feel like I have to pee all the time. Speaking of which, I have to pee right now, but I'm going to hold it for you guys, okay? My kidneys will be okay. It's best to pee regularly. Don't hold it. But I'm going to make the call right now. I'm going to hold it for you guys. Okay. Kidney disease. It's a problem because we're eating so much animal protein, animal fat, cholesterol, and salt. Our poor kidneys. And then if we remember from last chapter, last week, um, the diabetes chapter, Kidney function is really affected by um, blood sugar issues because if we have prolonged levels of high blood sugar, that can damage the filtration units called nephrons in our kidneys. So it appears that similar damage can be done by super salty foods. So that's a problem. And then you have the animal protein, which is acidic especially the sulfur-containing amino acids, like Dr. Greger points out, they break down into sulfuric acid. And so your kidneys try to neutralize that acid, and they do so by producing ammonia. 
and it's a good short-term solution if it only happens every now and then, but most people are doing it three or four times a day. Big protein hit. Ammonia has to be produced by the kidneys frequently, and that ends up screwing up your kidneys too. And so you end up getting a lot of inflammation, a lot of damage, and then to add insult to industry, insult to insult to injury, I can't stop trying to say industry, then you have the animal fat and the cholesterol which clogs the tiny little capillaries, you know, all over your body. Your kidneys aren't immune from atherosclerotic plaque and so blood flow ends up getting cut off to the kidneys and, and they're not as healthy as they need to be. They're not getting enough nutrition and enough oxygen to be able to function. So it's just not a good look altogether. Luckily, if we get rid of the animal products, we get rid of that animal protein, we get rid of the animal fat, we get rid of the cholesterol. And so then the question becomes like plant-based proteins. Yeah, how much is too much? And, um, you know, can they damage our kidneys the way that animal proteins can? Now, Dr. Greger suggests in here that no, in fact, they don't damage our kidneys this, in the same way. And while I certainly believe that and I agree, I still think that there's no reason to, um, to really purposefully try to overeat proteins, even plant-based proteins. You know, I recently made a video about the protein powders and everything like that. Really unnecessary. Um, most, pretty much all of them are made from isolated proteins. So you're taking like isolated soy protein or isolated pea protein or isolated hemp protein. And so it's not a whole food. You're getting the protein in large doses. It's not necessary. And even though it comes from plants, it still can affect acidity levels slightly. But the important take home is just like stick to whole plant foods. You don't need a ton of protein. You'll be fine, right? I see a lot of discussion going on in the comments section about salt. Yes, salt. We have uh, Megan says salt addiction is real. Hashtag salt addiction. It is true. And, um, you know, there is the addictive quality of it. We are designed as a species to really enjoy the taste of salt because it is such a rare mineral. Um, pretty much all mammals really love salt. And it's like, that's why if you put out a, a block of salt, it will attract animals. They'll come and lick it. You have animals who will travel like miles and miles and miles to get to a salt source. Animals will even eat rock or dirt to try to get some sodium. So, you know, I don't want to discount our desire for sodium as something that's just an addiction. It's very much ingrained in us as a species. There's also people who might have a little bit of kidney issues or people who have adrenal issues. Like I had adrenal issues and since the adrenal glands are so, so involved in fluid and electrolyte retention, my body, every time I tried to go onto a salt-free diet, I just didn't feel well. I felt spacey in my head. I had insane salt cravings. Like I can't even describe it to you how badly I wanted that salt. Um, and I did notice that when I allowed myself to eat salt, I felt better. Um, I, w I didn't feel spacey and weird after meals. I didn't feel, you know, hypohydrated just from drinking a normal amount of water. I noticed that my cravings went away. My, my satiety was a lot better, so I could eat a smaller amount of food and feel satisfied and done at the end of the meal. So, you know, I know we've talked about it before. It's like Dr. Greger provides this information about salt and blood pressure and salt as an oxidant. And then we see salt here as also being able to um, cause kidney damage, potentially. And then on the flip side, it's like some people need salt. And some people's blood pressure is so low that they can't go off salt, you know, or they'll literally be fainting. So I think it's important to just be mindful about that. And don't beat yourself up for your salt addiction, you know. Um, certainly moderate the amount that you eat, but do we need to go completely salt-free? 
I'm not sure about that. Some people thrive that way. Some people really struggle. And the people who struggle, I feel like need to revisit that a little bit more. Hope that helps. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, then we have the kidney stones issue. And, um, Mm. So, despite the fact that oxalates um, tend to form kidney stones, and despite the fact that there are a lot significant amount of oxalates in many vegetables, it does not appear that the oxalates in vegetables are associated with kidney stone formation. In fact, people who eat a lot of vegetables are less likely to form kidney stones, even if they are stone formers, right? So um, it does really seem to be tied into the amount of meat that you're eating and the acidity of your urine seems to be the most telling factor. So has anyone done the purple cabbage test? I keep meaning to, but then I'm like, oh, I'll do it next time I have to pee. I'll do it next time. And then I look at my red cabbage and I'm like, I don't want to flush you down the toilet. I want to eat you because you're a great source of cheap antioxidants. So, I don't know, has anyone done it? Um, about the salt thing, Kelsey says, I actually went to the doctor for it and all the tests, oh, that's something different. Oh, she said, I get dizzy spells occasionally and don't have any clue what triggers it. I went to the doctor for it and tests were inconclusive. I mean, it's hard to say. It could be a blood pressure thing. It um, could be an electrolyte thing. It's it's difficult to say not being a doctor, although it sounds like your doctor couldn't figure it out either. Um, Love It All says, I do enjoy moderation and notice when I get too much, I try to scale back, talking about the salt. Um, yeah. Mmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Equivocal Truth says, I love miso. Was that in, yeah, the miso discussion wasn't in this one, but it is in the bean chapter, as far as, like, miso soup being made from soybeans, which are protective, and then, um, protective against issues that could be associated with high salt intake, but it's also very high in salt, so it, it seems to, like, cancel each other out, but, okay. Um, Brianna says, I've never heard of the cabbage test before. What is it? Oh, Brianna. Brianna, you didn't read the book. <laughs> Where is it? Okay. <laughs> Testing your pH with purple cabbage. What page are we on there? That's page 172 of How Not to Die. You got the cabbage test. So you can get like pH strips and pee on it to figure out what the what the pH of your pee is. But um, yes, Kelly, you can use the pH strip. But um, you can blend up cabbage or like boil cabbage and then use the, the water and like pour it into the toilet after you've peed. And then depending on the color that the cabbage turns, depends on how acidic your urine is. Oh, jeez. I was going to do a video on my channel about it, but I have to get that. Oh, um, that's different. Purely Soul says, I really wish I could stay, but I'm, um, these are my favorites, but I'm going to find some. Okay. I'll see you. Thank you for coming, and thank you for moderating Purely Soul. I so appreciate it. Um, oh, I see no one else is, like, hugely interested in mixing their pea with cabbage. Okay. Noted. I thought it would be a great topic, but I guess not. Okay, so I'm interested in the phosphorus and the nitrates discussion because, you know, as much as I know about plant-based diets, I feel like the last five times I read this book, I was more, um, I was more focused on um, the, the other issues like the fat and the cholesterol and the animal protein effect on kidney health. Mm. I need to stop drinking or I'm going to pee on myself. Um, so this time I feel like I absorbed a little bit more information about the, um, oops, the phosphorus and the nitrates. So the interesting thing about the phosphorus was that the different forms 
that was that was interesting to me. So animal foods have phosphate, and that's it has about a 75% absorption rate. So 75% of phosphate that is in an animal food will be absorbed. Plants have phytates, and those have about a 50% absorption rate. So, you know, 50% of the um, phytates that are in those plant foods will be absorbed. So then processed foods, that would be like phosphate food additives, like they mentioned, go into a lot of sodas and stuff. And the, the phosphate that's put into meat to change its color and to make it weigh more, like this stuff is literally injected into the meat, and then to prevent juice seepage from coming out of the meat while it's sitting in the supermarket, um, that has about a 100% absorption rate, and that kind of blew my mind. Um, there's a quote on page 173 about the 11 different types. Okay, yeah. In the United States, 11 different types of phosphate salts are allowed to be injected into raw meat and poultry, a practice that's long been banned in Europe. And all of our dear European friends are asleep right now. <laughs> this is because phosphates found in meat and processed foods are considered vascular toxins capable of impairing our arterial function within hours of consuming a high phosphate meal. In meat, there's an additional food safety concern as adding phosphate may increase the growth of food poisoning bacteria Campylobacter in poultry seepage in the purge by about a million fold. So that's like, that's so gross. That's so gross. Oh, oh, Catherine. Catherine's in Europe and she's awake. Hardcore. Hardcore. I love it. I do also hope that you sleep really well tonight, but it's hardcore. Okay. Seepage. Yes, that's a terrible word. Terrible word. Okay, so, you know, it's again another example of meat being something that, um, you know, it's like you pick up most foods. And you pick up a fruit or a vegetable and you pretty much know what it is. Sure, there might be some pesticide contamination, but it's not like fruits and vegetables are being injected with random gross ingredients. Whereas you pick up meat and not only is there no nutrition label that tells you how much fat or sodium or whatever's in it, but there's also no label that tells you the ingredients. And I know that I would just assume and so many people would just assume that it's just meat. You know, it's just an animal carcass, which is bad enough on its own, but then it has all of these additives in it that people aren't even aware of. And I'm sure most of us have no idea that phosphate is a health concern, especially when it comes to um, kidney health and such. But it says here on page 174 that a supermarket survey found that more than 90% of chicken products contained phosphate additives. And then there's that really interesting little um, gray square about who who determines whether food additives are safe. And long story short, it's the people who make them. It's really... Yeah. Yeah, Sarah says that um, something being banned in Europe should be an alarm to most Americans. And I feel like it should be. It should be alarming. Like, this is it's alarming. <laughs> Um, the other interesting thing that I learned quite a bit about from this chapter was the, um, the nitrate you. And you'll remember that in the hypertension chapter, he talked about the nitric oxide in fruits and, or vegetables mostly, the nitric oxide in vegetables, which help to relax the arteries, which lowers blood pressure, and it's thus very protective. So foods like beets and lettuce and arugula and cilantro and um, chard, those kinds of foods were, were really protective because of their nitric oxide, because of their nitrates. However, <laughs> nitrates can ferment or be fermented into nitrites, and nitrites are often used to cure meat. 
um, nitrates can ferment into nitrites on their own, like apparently celery has a bunch, as it said in How Not to Die, but in order for them to be harmful, they have to turn into nitrosamines, um, which you might remember from the, um, the lung disease chapter is a carcinogen that's found in cigarettes. They can also turn into nitrosamides. And um, these are also the compounds that get into the cooking fumes. Do you understand? So when you're cooking bacon or something, the nitrosamines that are in the bacon that you'll eat can also get into the air and then you breathe them in. And these are highly carcinogenic compounds. So a lot of times these are just added to foods, especially processed meats. So again, processed meats, big problem. That's probably why they're known to be a carcinogen from the World Health Organization. Um, but the interesting thing, because I started to get a little concerned, I was like, oh my god, if celery has these these nitrates that can ferment into nitrites, like, oh, am I in trouble? But apparently the plant foods, plants contain the antioxidants, such as vitamin C, which can block the formation of these nitrites and nitrosamines. So this is something I'm interested in reading more about because again, I know I've read this several times before, but this this actually stuck this time. And that's why I like reading books more than once, right? Okay. So we can do a few minutes of Q and A if you guys if you have anything else to add about these chapters, if anything stood out and you'd like to talk about it, we can um, we can bring that up. And then we'll just do this for a few minutes, and then I have to pee. <laughs> oh, Equivocal Truth said, I learned about third-hand smoke, and damn, that pissed me off. Both my parents smoked in the home for my ch entire childhood and pregnancy. That's some bullshit. I mean, <laughs> that, that's some bullshit. Um, yeah, the third-hand smoke, which is like, the residues from the cigarettes that kind of sticks to walls and furniture inside cars, that kind of stuff. Um, that that s stuck out to me this time too. Um, it is concerning. And then, you know, this morning after I read this chapter, reread this chapter last night, and um, this morning there was a guy like smoking right next to my car when I was at the laundromat, and I was like this close, I was like, don't, don't be the howly bitch, don't, don't be the howly, and I like yell at this guy, and be like, why are you smoking, are you trying to kill me, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, um, Allie says, my friend told me she switched from almond to dairy milk, because the almond milk had too many chemicals, and people don't know what animal products have in them. Yeah, that's, um, you should let her, probably let her know that her milk might have bovine leukemia in it, since 100% of industrial dairy cows were found to have bovine leukemia. So that's, um, that's a concern. Redheaded Princess says, I know it's my second time reading How Not to Die, and there was so much I forgot. I know, I feel the same way every time I pick it up. I'm like, Really? <laughs> oh, Love It All says, I just have to tell you, Lily, you are incredibly intelligent, super inspiring, and I love you and your channel. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. I'm, um, apparently I'm frozen for someone. Sorry about that, Scrap Saturdays. But, um, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's always, it's always lovely to be praised. And, um, I know when I talk and stuff, I say I'm kind of smart. Just keep in mind that um, this is a lot of practice, and this is like many, many years of educating and like slowly building one piece of information on top of the other and learning how to articulate it through practice. So it's like, um, I say as I like completely brain fart and sound like an imbecile, <laughs> it's practice. And it's, it's not... I wasn't necessarily born this way. And, um, you know, I, I didn't go to school for this either. That's something that I do kind of regret is that I didn't just 
bite the bullet and go to school and you know I had my internal reasons for doing that but um, I I don't think it's a terrible thing to just be an example that um, you don't have to be college educated to know this stuff and you don't need to have a nutrition degree to understand nutrition and to be able to take care of yourself. <laughs> and yeah, like, dude, do you know what's in your hot dog? Yeah, what was that? Oh, I wrote it down. It was like, um, yeah, nitrosamines, one hot dog is the equivalent of four cigarettes. That's on page 175 for anyone who wants to quote that to your friends. All right. <laughs> Love it all says, I want to say that so many times to people, but they always come with, up with, you know, they say vegans don't get enough, you know, blank, whatever. And so you shouldn't say, and as they shove hot dogs in their mouth. Yeah, it is kind of ironic, huh? Maggie... Maggie says, I'm learning so much from this book and this group. Thank you all. Have a beautiful weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy. I hope you guys go forth and um, use your weekend, if you don't work on the weekends, to cook beans and eat beans and have turmeric and maybe start some, and maybe make a peanut sauce to put on your sprouts glad that you're giving, giving that to yourself. And it's so beautiful when we can um, kind of get to the root of those addictive patterns. I know I traded off addictions for a long time. It would be like drinking and then smoking and then maybe some drug use. And if I wasn't doing that, I was binge eating or just eating really icky foods. And so to be able to kind of bring it full circle <laughs> and to be able to... Um, get to the root of why that was happening is, is such a special thing. So congratulations. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. All right. Dima says, I feel the same way. I kind of wanted to get a nutritionist dietitian training just so people would listen to me, but I didn't want to have to learn all the misinformation. I get it, man. I still think about going back to school sometimes. Um, it's usually like, I should know. Um, I'm not sure, but it's like the, uh, anyway, you don't have to be a nutritionist to understand how to feed yourself and pre prevent disease. Okay. All right, you guys, I'm going to take off. Oh, Sylvia says today is my six month going plant based anniversary, I assume. And I'm so grateful to have found you because you have helped me so much along the process. I'm so glad. I just... It is my humble pleasure to be able to have any positive influence on anyone's life. <laughs> Britt says, I feel like I would change the college professors if they recommended me. It's harder than it sounds, but you can always try. I have heard some really great stories about people being like, you know, their, their professors actually listen, responding to the science and the evidence, so yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful. okay. And way to go, everyone who's made any awesome changes in their lives, you know, and who's done the hard stuff. Wow, my says I've beaten bulimia for two years now thanks to veganism. Well done. I had that one too, man. It's it's not easy, so that's awesome. <laughs> is Petun? Pet I don't think Petunia's barking right now. Might be another dog. I think it's my neighbor's dog. They're like the Hawaii chained up dogs and they just bark all day. Sad. Okay. All right, you guys, I'm gonna go take a phenomenal pee. So <laughs> thank you for being here. I'm so happy to be spending this time with you guys every week, even though I do get nervous every single time. Every live stream, I'm like a little bit panicky but that's just because I'm a super introvert. But um, I love you guys, and thank you. Eat beans, sprout beans, sprout seeds, eat your greens, enjoy your smoothies, get your turmeric, avoid bacon like the plague. <laughs> and, um, mm. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, chapters for next week. <laughs> We're going to do um, three more chapters, you guys. It's going to be a stretch. So that's going to be 
Um, I wanted to get breast cancer and prostate cancer in the same one. So we're doing a little cancer and suicide sandwich, just for lack of better description. Um, how not to die from breast cancer, how not to die from suicidal depression, and how not to die from prostate cancer. I'm sure we have lots to talk about. Okay. All right, you guys. Thank you again. And, um, <laughs> bananas here. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Sarah, you're too funny. All right, Anna, don't worry about it. We're all just here to learn. It's great. And thank you for coming. Okay. Song of Life, sorry you're late, but we'll see you. All right, I'll see you guys later. Hopefully Hawaii doesn't get another ballistic missile warning this week and I can get back to it. Okay, thank you guys. I'll see you. Bye.